And for those who enjoy this channel and would love to support us financially, please feel free to hit that donate link. We'd greatly appreciate it. God bless. Well, it looks like we're live, guys. We've got an exciting debate tonight. We've got Speed of Sound, who's been here before, as well as John Maddox who needs no introduction, of course. He's been here many times before as well. We've, uh, we're gonna be debating intelligent design versus naturalism tonight. So um, everybody in the audience, um, hopefully you're excited this one because this one's been in, in the making for a while. Uh, we've been putting out a lot of debates, discussions, keep everybody entertained. Uh, we have a few more as well that we're working on getting confirmed in, in the next week. Uh, tomorrow we do have uh, John Maddox versus Gutzik Gibbon on roughly the same topic. So that one is confirmed for 9.30. Uh, be sure to look out for that one. That one's going to be exciting. So uh, before we get into it, why don't we give the um, debaters, both Mike and John, uh, just a moment of introduction. If they want to plug in their channels or, or tell us what, what they're doing, what they're up to, I think that's always a good way to start. Um, Mike, why don't we uh, start with you? How's it going? It's going good. I would like to have a channel, but uh, production is a little bit difficult, and uh, I suck at it. So I haven't put anything, I haven't put anything on my channel yet. It's good. I had to name it "Speed of Sound of Gravity" because speed of sound had too many, too much noise. Uh, anyway, basically, I'm a high school dropout from the Iron Range, and I started my career out as an iron miner. Uh, prior to that, I was a baker, actually, but iron miner is what I was, and I don't know much. And that's about all I got to say. 
<laughs> well, we always appreciate you giving us your time. So uh, thanks for that there, Mike. You're always welcome, of course, on this channel, especially with debates and discussions. Uh, you know, we look for gracious dialogue, um, you know, with, with differing opinions. So we always welcome those with differing opinions. John, uh, thanks for being with us today. Uh, over to you, brother. Oh, excited to be here again. Hopefully we'll have a uh, great uh, conversation. My channel is uh, Logical, Plausible, Probable. So if you uh, want to see some of my videos, just go over there. I try to look at uh, different arguments and different aspects of existence, philosophy, and uh, in this context, intelligent design versus uh, naturalism and random chance occurrences to account for our existence. Um, part of the reason I uh, do this is I almost died about seven years ago, and in that uh, time frame, I realized that there was much more to existence and than just being consumed with uh, making money, and I decided to use uh, the gifts I was given uh, to make arguments and uh, hopefully open people's eyes to the uh, what I like to call, which is the greatest scam on earth, and a little jab towards Richard Dawkins uh, that... Uh, there is much more evidence to our existence being the result of a creator and an intelligent designer rather than undirected process. Awesome. Thanks, John. Yeah. If, uh, if, if you like what John's saying and, and the stuff he's putting out, please look uh, to his channel and, and subscribe. He's got some great content. Uh, same with speed of sound. I know you said you're not really putting out much right now, but if people are interested, if they like what they're hearing, go over there and uh, subscribe to Mike. So uh, that being said, why don't we jump into just some brief opening statements, equally timed. I'm not sure who wants to start, but if, if there's a volunteer, and then we're going to jump into just free flowing dialogue and discussion for the uh, remaining portion of the debate. Uh, which one of you guys would like to start? I'll start. I've only got about, uh, mine is going to take about one minute. Sure, sure. You take your time, and then we'll we'll hand it over to John for him to take his time, and then boom, we're going to jump right into discussion. Go ahead, Mike. So I have a book here by uh, called The Logic of Chance by Eugene V. Kunin uh, that uh, when I was in a debate with Nephilim, he quoted this book on page 391, and I looked up uh, intelligent design in the index, and I found two entries. Uh, the most amazing one was... Uh, uh, a little note in the back where he says um, he was talking about Michael uh, or B, uh, B. He says uh, an irreducible complexity. He says to be be he and other ID advocates the irre irreducibility of complex biological structures is evidence, even proof of the inevitability of ID. And then he says, of course, ID is malicious nonsense. But the term irreducible complexity is quite evocative. However, evolutionary biologists might prefer to speak of apparent or purported irreducibility of complex structures. So he's not your friend, basically. And uh, if you look on page 391, you read a little further on, he uh, sort of makes a case for the logic of chance and probability. Anyway, that's my opening. That's all I got. Done. All right. Uh, praise. I got to share my screen. I get to watch. Hey, praise. It's not letting me share. Do you have the uh, share settings turned off? It's not giving me the praise. The I think praise, praise might have fallen asleep there for a second. I got it. I got it. I got it. <laughs> All right. So tonight, folks, we're going to talk about intelligent design versus ultimately undirected processes. And my position is we have to decide which one is the more plausible conclusion. And as a foundation to that, you know, what is really required for life? Now, there's literally thousands of different uh, elements that are all recognized as being requirements for uh, life as we know it. But at the ultimate core is the genetic code, its uh, syntax, semantics, and pragmatics. And then ultimately how that translates into gene expression, uh, DNA being turned into RNA, uh, RNA being translated into a protein, and then ultimately protein 
uh, post-ribosome uh, synthesis being modified for ultimate outcomes. Now, uh, the reason I bring this as kind of a foundational piece is uh, this uh, quote here, the origin of the code is perhaps the most perplexing problem in evolutionary biology. The existing translation machinery is at the same time so complex, so universal, and so essential that it is the hard to it is hard to see how it could have come into existence or how life could have existed without it. It's James Smith and E. I do not pronounce that last guy's, that guy's name, but uh, Oxford Press from 1995. Now, the genetic code enigma is a commonly used uh, term in a variety of papers, and I want to dive into the fundamentals of it and how it fulfills all the parameters of a code. So codes require arbitrary values, uh, coding tables, a translation process that is done by turning it into also arbitrarily assigned values. And in the context of genetics, uh, codon equals amino acid is a fundamental component, but most importantly, and why these are unavoidable arbitrary value assignments is codons are translated by the ribosome. Codons do not become amino acids and codons do not chemically interact with amino acids. So to say that there is not a direct semantic information transfer occurring is uh, ignoring reality, which is there is no actual interaction other than through a mediary. And uh, this is another quote I, I love. Even a perfunctory inspection of the standard genetic code uh, table, yada, yada, shows that the arrangement of amino acid assignments is manifestly non-random. Now, going a step further in the genetic code enigma is that it also fulfills parameters of a programming language. It has input, output, codons equal syntax, space plus time expression equal semantics, controlled variable outcomes equals pragmatics. It has if then else functions and has been determined to be a Turing complete model. Great. One of my favorite quotes from uh, Dennis Noble, a Royal Society fellow, this is back in 2015. Where then does the full algorithmic logic of a program lie? Where, for example, do we find the equivalent of if then else type instructions? The answer is in the cell or organism as a whole, not just in the genome, which takes the foundation of the argument that I'm making to an entirely different level, which is that this is a complex multi-directional communication system and programming aspect of biological function and biological computation, which enables the expression of these uh, parameters that are required for life to exist. So therefore, if codes require intelligence to assign arbitrary values, and decoding requires equal arbitrarily assigned values, and the genetic code is encoded, transferred, and decoded, and genetic expression requires translation of arbitrary values, then it is my assertion a mind was required for the genetic code to exist. If coding and programming information semantics are immaterial, and the medium which contains it is not relevant to its existence, then no undirected process can have created it. If programming requires if-then-else logic rules and semantic, uh, syntax, semantics, and pragmatics are required for its execution, and biological cells contain all of these and the tools for execution, and no other programming, and if no other programming would happen by chance, then in biology and for our existence, an intelligent agent is required for the initial programming. And then from a root uh, chemistry perspective, cause and effect, physical determinism, in other words, cannot account for the programming of sequence dependent biofunction. Now that's uh, kind of the end of my initial statement there, but the things we have to really uh, consider is that when you really start to consider the plethora of variables that are required which circumvent pure cause and effect uh, deterministic chemistry and uh, there's plenty of other aspects in other papers where they talk about how they uh, biology itself needs to be removed from uh, physics and chemistry uh, basic physics and chemistry because it circumvents uh, those basic rules in so many different aspects so let's, I'm ready to get into this debate but I hope uh, people will consider those arguments and really start to ponder things beyond just, hey, it just happened, therefore we are here, and actually look at the requirements for life to exist.
Awesome. Well, thanks for that opening statement there, John. Thanks to you as well, Mike. We are going into a free-flowing discussion. I'm here, obviously, in case things get out of hand, um, but I, I've, I've seen both of you debate, so I doubt that I'm going to have to jump in. Just keep it respectful and as equally timed as possible. So whoever wants to ask the first question or start, go ahead. Oh, uh, let's see. Uh, this Dennis Noble guy. Uh, so you kind of like, you like him, basically? Um, I mean, my, like a lot of the stuff he talks about, yeah. I mean, he's, got um, very, he, he's an atheist and he's a evolutionist, but it doesn't mean that uh, he doesn't recognize the... Actually, I don't know if he's an atheist anymore, but uh, I mean, he's still an evolutionist, but it doesn't mean that he does not recognize that the perfunctory elements to my argument are absolutely in existence and are not in a uh, analogous or met analogies or metaphors. They are literal and whether or not I have a different interpretation of the root cause um, between he and I has no re relevance to the position that I'm taking. Okay. So uh, Dennis Noble in uh, Dance to the Tune of Life, he, he talks about programs and code and DNA, and he pushes back seriously against it. In fact, it's, uh, <clears throat> in his uh, Principles of Systems Biology, he said the theory, uh, let's see, uh, there is no genetic program. There are no programs at any other level. There are no programs in the brain, basically. And he said this is true of all such programs. To call them genetic programs or gene networks is to fuel a misconception that all of the act active causal determination lies in one-dimensional DNA sequences. It doesn't. It also lies in three-dimensional static and dynamical structures of the cell, tissues, and organs. Uh, Dennis Noble is probably one of the guys that are on the forefront of biosemiotics. And uh, I have uh, been into biosemiotics and embodied mind theory since 2010 about. Uh, 2012 was my introduction to biosemiotics with uh, Terrence uh, Deacon. Uh, he, he wrote a book and he did a thing on NPR. I was driving home from uh, Northern Minnesota, listened to him talk for two hours about about the uh, new paradigm in biology, which is basically that uh, they admit that DNA, that the strand of DNA is information. Uh, they admit that there is a code there and the code is not connected. Semiotics is about basically signs. Uh, you, have a, uh, you have a sign, which would be the DNA. You have a code maker or a convention, which would be a ribosome. And then you have a result, which would be the protein or life in the cell or whatever. So these guys, uh, you mentioned a whole bunch of papers from the Royal Society. I think well, I mentioned one. I printed out about 20 of them, and none of them say anything about intelligent design in a favorable manner, or uh, nor do they make the logical inference from it is complex, therefore it has to be designed. Well, I'm, I'm not, as, as I stated a moment ago, I'm not really, I'm pretty sure I said that uh, I recognize that uh, Dennis Noble specifically doesn't have the same uh, root opinion as I do. It doesn't mean that it changes the uh, logic behind my my argument, which is if these things are required for life, which as you just admitted, they also admit is true, then uh, for me to make the conclusion that it is not a reasonable uh, root cause of our existence that those things could happen without uh, intelligence because in no other context could they uh, doesn't really have any relevance and I'm not really sure where your what your point is because they disagree uh, doesn't really have any relevance to our discussion of okay my point is you came up with a quote that sounded like he was saying that DNA was a code well and his well, book says that no that well, he is well as well as of uh, I believe it was May oh, of 2019 uh, he is now sitting on, he and the Royal Society officially joined a convention to have a $10 million prize for anybody who can come up with a natural code. He actually deemed it the, uh, I believe it was the least addressed question in science and is going to be one of the judges of it. And the specifics were, it had to fulfill the, uh, all of the fundamentals of a uh, code just like a uh, we apply to any other type of coding. So uh, he 
he may have changed his opinion since his book because this was uh, 2019 and you can go to uh, the Oxford uh, YouTube channel and watch uh, the interviews with him uh, discussing this in rather in great detail as he and the uh, Royal Society became components of this. What do you think offering this prize means he changed his mind? Because uh, he literally stated what he, uh, what it was literally stated what uh, the requirements were and that yes, this does, this is genetics and genetics does embody all of these things. And yes, it is a code. So I'm not, I'm not really here to go back and forth on what, uh, what Dennis Noble's opinion is. If anybody just doesn't believe me, go, uh, go over to the Oxford's channel and uh, not go, go watch the, go watch the interview. I don't follow how offering a $10 million prize for proof of aid biogenesis or complex system developing itself, which is what Lee Cronin is working on, leads to the conclusion that Dennis Noble has suddenly changed his mind and that his book, which was written in, uh, let's see, when did he write Dance of Life? Uh, do you have any idea? Uh, I don't know. I go with uh, what he said last year and another one of his papers where he goes into great detail about this about program. He wrote this in 2017. So, I mean, that's two years ago. You think he changed himself radically from that? Well, Basically, all I know is in 2019 is what I'm referring to. So and, two years. Hey, hey, listen, listen, Mike, 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 we're not going to sit here and waste time on arguing about Dennis Noble. We're here to discuss uh, the just existence of, of, of life. And I, I have just answered your question, which is, do I think he has changed his opinion? I would say so, given the fact that as of May 2019, he is now an official arbiter and judge of this as a representative of the royal society which quote his words uh one of the most we're, we're we're kind of the most one of the most prestigious institutions on the planet um so i, I suggest you take it up with him if you disagree or go watch the videos and yeah, his interview no but, i don't have to take it up with him i have to take it up with you because you're wrong about what dennis noble thinks i'm quite familiar with what he thinks and i've listened to a great deal of his work i have his papers i have his book i was reading his book today uh you picked a quote out of somewhere, and I'm not sure exactly where you got that quote. You probably got it out of this book. No, I actually got, I got it from those papers. But anyway, look again at the Mike, Royal Mike, Michael, why don't we move on to something okay, that's more sure. substantive than you and I having a pissing contest over what Dennis Noble thinks well, we're versus, having a versus, versus the arguments that I have made, which are <clears> – <throat> well, I'll ask you a direct question. Uh, since you're into biosemiotics, which I am as well, uh, is it your a uh, position that I think you mentioned this, but I just want to clarify: Is it your position that the genetic code is exactly that? It has immaterial information that is translated in expressed uh, into all aspects of biological function. I don't know what immaterial information is. Uh, I don't agree with that term are, at all. Are, are, semant are semantics immaterial or material? Material. Everything is material. So you I'm think that you, you think that the you think is that, so you, it is your opinion that the meaning of a word is material versus immaterial. The meaning of the word is material. Yes. How so? How so? Uh, that's what biosemiotics teaches teaches us is the relations the relationship of the triad, basically the sign, the convention, and the object. So there's a triad there. It's all material. Nobody denies that. It's Charles Sanders Pierce. Are you familiar with him? Uh, I, I know the name, and I I would say that there are quite a few Charles papers Sanders where they Pierce. from bios, from people in biosemiotics that clearly talk about immaterial information. But go ahead. Charles Sanders Pierce uh, basically created semiotics, and uh, well, he didn't he didn't invent it, but he definitely laid down the Bible for it. So. And his uh, his whole point was the relationship, and that it that it has a physical manifestation. We we take the signs basically in our subjective opinion, our hominid, two making ape opinion, that it is immaterial, and we 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 imagine these immaterial things. But at the end of the day, it is always all material there's nothing that you can show me that is not material in the world we're communicating through a material medium right now is, is mathematics material yes how it is based on is, are, are mathematical principles material not not ba what they're based on are, are the mathematical principles actually material yes you get pi from a circle and a circle is a material thing something can be something can be executed 
but it doesn't mean that the root of it is material. Is logic material? Yes. You you, you think logical thought is a mater- is material? Totally. Not that not, not that you can execute something via logic, but that the logical principle itself. You're saying that that is material. It is. It's definitely in the material world. The re- we we get no, the, the, the the effect the effect of it can be executed in the material world. The you logic know. itself is not. That's a well established premise in uh, philosophy that mathematics and, and logic is immaterial. You're tending to talk over me a little bit. Uh, basically, we get the idea of logical conditions like and or not whatever by material objects, and that's how our brain is built. We start out with nothing in our brain, basically, uh, except a few connections, and the material world teaches us logic, teaches us mathematics, teaches us all these connections. It's all in the world, and at some level, you can always find it in the world. Okay, so is your, uh, so you are stating, so are you stating that arbitrary of values that are assigned to something uh those but are only interpreted through an intelligent agent in any other context that we recognize or through a physical component like a computer that uh has been given the logic rules to interpret it you are are you stating that arbitrary and abstract uh values are material yes well, I mean, that literally goes against the definition of abstract. You are go- we're going to go down a metaphysical hole here that's pretty deep. Uh, do you want to do that, or do you want to talk about programming and program code? Well, um, that's where I was going, and you've been... I'm a straight man. So, 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 so I, guess, I guess what I'm... I guess, let's, let's, let's go down to the coding route. Okay, so in any other context other than genetics, uh, could... Is it your opinion that what we view as programming languages, the syntax, semantics, and pragmatics, which are required for them, uh, and then the translational uh, compilation uh, processes, is it your position that those things can happen without intelligent agents? Programs? You mean computers? Yeah. I'm 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 talking about programming languages. Could they happen without intelligent agents? Yes. Can the arbitrary... Not very likely. I mean, that, that's a, could they or could they not? Because we're talking about arbitrary values being assigned and syntax, which is, I mean, to the syntax, and then the interpretation process for the semantics and the yeah. pragmatics. So yeah, it, that's a pretty much a yes or no question. Can they be done with, an, with, with or without an intelligent agent? I'm pretty much not a yes or no kind of guy. You're familiar with Douglas Adams and the whale and the, uh, let's see, what was that, a whale and... A what else was it? A plant, a pitcher that were created suddenly in the void up above, and they were crashing toward Earth. Are you familiar with that scene? Uh, when you, uh, say, I, I have a direct question about computer about programming languages. Computers are material, so I mean, if a star. I'm talking about the language. Huh? I'm talking about the language and the meaning assigned to the language, which is the which is how it is actually becomes worth anything and can execute any function. How can that, can those logic rules and the syntax, semantics, and pragmatics, which are required for any programming language to exist, this is a very well-documented and recognized fact in computer science and information theory, can those things exist without intelligence agents? In any other context, removing, stepping aside from na- nature, can any of those things exist without an intelligent agent? Yes, they exist in biology without an intelligent agent. I literally just said, stepping aside from the biological argument in any other context can they exist without an intelligent agent i don't have the imagination to find one right now so uh maybe not but i'm sure we could think of something well i, I actually i don't think you can because it's recognized that uh other Did than uh what we see in genetics that every single other variation has been pre- created by an intelligent agent your mind did not create the intelligence, basically, or, or the information. The information created your mind, and now you're trying to take credit for it. And I see it the other way around. Do you know what a strict naturalist is? You're I, I, I'm, I'm aware with that. So it is your position that the 
uh, when Turing and von Neumann and the others were creating computer science and the, I mean, heck binary was created back in like 1638. Um, are you suggesting that the intelligence of the person who originally created binary, I forget his name, uh, are you saying that he did not create binary code? No. He came up with it. That's what, the punch card, I think, was kind of the beginning of computation, and that was a physical medium. And they were, they used to I have... Mean, I mean, the abacus was the original uh, physical very, uh, piece of uh, computation. Yeah, we could and, then, and, then, and then binary was created, I think, I'm pretty sure it was 1638 or 1632, somewhere around there. If um, you want to be retro, yeah, go ahead. My, well, I mean, binary is not exactly retro. I mean, it's used in literally everything that we do in technology today. But the point I'm making is that binary originally existed in a thought and then was transcribed into a uh, physically interpretable uh, medium. And then now, and then fast forward uh, to the 60s and was being able to be executed through uh, physical punch cards. And then now the exact same premise is being executed in a uh, electronic uh, form with modern technologies. The but this again this goes back to are you in your strict naturalist perspective are you suggesting that without the minds of the humans who developed these things over centuries that these things could ever have come into existence? I don't. You're asking if human tools could come into existence without humans. I'm asking if the syntax, semantics, and pragmatics, which you are arguing are purely material, could ever come into existence without an intelligent agent existing in order to derive them and assign the values. Depends on how you define intelligence. How are you defining intelligence? You're defining intelligence as human intelligence. So this might disagree with you. Okay. Do you actually think? that a bird can could develop binary code a bird could develop uh we got a woodpecker all back and i swear he's working on it uh but, but answer questions directly man not just trying to dodge every single one if you're if strict naturalist if all you're going to do is no, you're well, I, to, guess, I guess a bird might be able, this is a very, it's a very basic question and you yeah. like to talk over people don't you you're trying to get me to say that uh, uh, basically, a human tool can come into existence without a human. Probably not. Not likely. I mean, uh, computers are human tools, and we derive them from the physical nature of our surroundings. A monkey, if they co if covered its eyes and uncovered its eyes, he just invented binary. I mean, it exists in the physical world, and it's, it's no it's, in a prejudiced manner. You're you're defining information as having to have an intelligence. It's the other way around. Information. No, 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 I'm intelligence. No, I am arguing that syntax, semantics, and pragmatics and arbitrarily assigned values require intelligence. What do you think pragmatics is? How do you define that? Concern. Uh, let's let's talk about DNA and the ribosome. How would you define pragmatics in that? Well, in in terms of pragmatics, I mean, there's a plethora of. Uh, different ways that could be uh, interpreted, but the controlled variable outcomes, for example, one would be um, the micro RNAs the, when they're silencing or modifying the outcome of a uh, gene sequence to have a different outcome based on uh, external variables, i.e. stress, heat, cold, sickness, uh, shortage of uh, whichever the end protein is. The it modifies the data on the fly and so that, changes right. the outcome. Yeah. The, you also have things like epigenetics, which, as I'm sure you're aware, can dramatically modify the core. Uh, and this is a, you know, obviously a hybrid of or a conjunction of semantics and, and pragmatics, but are dramatically changing the outcome of what would be the standard uh, variable. Right. And those are the things that in programming are baseline fundamentals to even be considered a programming language and programming language works like that where it modifies its own code well if you're getting into dynamic programming and what we're trying to do with machine learning and artificial intelligence then absolutely 
Well, uh, machine learning, we don't, we don't exactly know how those neural networks do what they do. We train them up and we can look at the micro states. We can look at the micro level, but nobody knows after you've trained a, and uh, basically a neural net to recognize a rabbit in a, a Google image, nobody knows exactly how that recognition happens. I can tell that kind of intelligence is pretty much beyond us. And that's how the cell works basically. But anyway, on prime no, no, I'm, I'm aware of that. And the point I'm making is that we are attempting to create the type of computational ability and dynamic variable expression of functions. We are attempting to do that in every aspect of human technology at the highest level. Like we are trying to pull that off. Are you a and programmer? I am. What do you program in? Uh, Python, uh, PHP, uh, JavaScript, and I know the other mark, you know, markup languages, HTML, CSS. Um, I, well, I used to uh, own a software development company. The, now I do, now I do mostly consulting, but the, uh, it's, anyway, go ahead. You familiar with Haskell? Haskell and functional programming languages? I, Haskell? What, what is your point? Yes, I'm, you familiar, familiar? I'm, I'm familiar with all. Just kids. What's your, what's your point? Are you familiar with Haskell? It's a yes or no question. You love. Oh, oh now, oh now you want yes or no. You won't answer any of my stuff. Yes or no. Well, and, okay. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, continue. Go ahead. Exp expand your point. So you don't know what Haskell is. Anyway, okay. expand your point. Functional programming languages are. I, I, no, I'm just curious about what your background is and what you develop. And uh, what do you do with Python? What, what kind of, I, I'm curious as I've, to- I've played, I've played around mostly with bioinformatics stuff with Python, but- um, okay. okay, yeah, I do a lot of bioinformatics with Python myself. And, uh, but I'm pretty much a Ruby, uh, React, ES6 programmer, uh, Ruby and uh, what, C, C++, I don't know, a whole bunch of other stuff. I've been doing this for 40 years. Anyway, uh, back to pragmatics. Uh, your man uh, from the Royal Society, Adami, wrote a paper, and he talks about pragmatics, and I think he defines it as you, we have information, like we have information in DNA, and then pragmatics is uh, when you have an observer. So you have, you have a human around that's basically deciding, okay, this DNA turns into a protein, and it has this function, and it does this, and basically that's how he defines pragmatics. But it was, uh, you know, those guys, they get so deep into information theory. But what I don't see any of them doing is claiming there has to be an intelligence to create bi create biological information in that DNA code. Uh, there is a, uh, you know, like that DNA code, it could have been anything, right? You, you agree with that? It could have been an alternative code? Well, I, I think in the studies that I've read, yes, there's, uh, I think it's like 10 to the 80 seconds of, or 80 nights, something like that, of possibles um but they determined that what what, 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 is that? what what are you talking about 10 to the 89th for possible what possible codes possible. um the but the one the one that we experience is it would be infinite because you could have as many codons as you want you could always well, have another codon i mean it's infinite it's not there's no number for that well, it just happens to be. Uh, well, the paper I read, I believe it was ten to the 89th. It was either ten to the 82nd, ten to the 89th. I forget. Um, do you know what paper that is? Talk, huh? Do you know what paper that is? I'll have to go look. I was reading it last night. I'll have to look it up again. Can the, you? Uh, we, yes, dude. Okay. Anyway, the point is, okay, whether it's infinite or ten to the 80. I mean, ten to, in context of reality, as I'm sure you're aware, ten to, something that's ten to the 89th is basically the equivalent of infinite. Yeah. Okay. The, basically the code is disconnected from the amino acid that gets hooked onto the nascent uh protein and it's completely independent and there are alternative there are alternative uh there are alternative interpretations of those four four nucleic acids that exist in the mitochondria and they exist in a lot of uh, some pro prokaryotes so there are different codes basically but this one seems to be pretty much universal in eukaryotes and most prokaryotes now. Right. But I mean, it was not necessarily that way in the past. It could have been very, very different in the past. So anyway, uh, you do agree that there could be alternative 
codes and if there is no connection. Well, and then, I mean, of course, there's alternative. I mean, there's of course there's alternatives. I mean, right now, every major tech company on the planet is trying to create their own uh, syntax to do uh, data storage in DNA under different uh, uh, different variations. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously, and that's the that's kind of the point is the yes beyond all doubt there is a programming uh code base that is being executed in genetics so whether or not there are other variations i mean that's like saying oh in using english you could and english and binary uh you could only have c plus plus i mean that's the yeah, it's kind of the equivalent of what is being said here. Of, oh, yeah, there's other possibilities. However, what they have discovered, and I'm sure you're probably aware, is that the one we experience is uh, probably, I think it was the word they used, the most stable uh, version. What? Like, Why? Uh, that's what they said in the research that I read. Um, I you don't know why you, you don't understand why what you, you mean the three codes well, there's, robust, there's robustness there's uh Wait a redundant, minute. there's redundancy i mean there's a, we can go off on that whole tangent if you want to i'm just stating what was uh has been relatively established in genetics. i've never heard that i've never heard that in all my all my reading of genetics and bio uh, molecular biology i've never heard that that was the best code i heard it was completely arbitrary i mean there's there's a number of number of ways. To so, so, you, so you are admitting that it's arbitrary value assignment. It is arbitrary, right? It's a code, and that's that's the whole point of biosemiotics, and that's where it differs from the reductive approach. Uh, the people that would say to you that it's it's just chemicals, you know, bumping into each other. I mean, there's something else going on with life, and obviously, life is a very very different kind of animal, <laughs> which. I can't believe I just said that. But anyway, it's a very, very different thing in the physical world than, uh, than say, rock. Well, there are some really interesting rocks, and there are some very interesting inorganic compounds and, and uh, crystals and really strange structures. So I don't know if I want to be uh, prejudiced toward, you know, and say life is so wonderful. But anyway, there is an information structure in life, and it is also autopoietic. Are you familiar with autopoiesis? Uh, I'm actually glad that you're going down this rabbit hole. Continue. Okay. Autopoiesis? Are you familiar? I don't, I don't know if I remember that term, but I'm very okay. happy you're going down. You're admitting anyway, that anyway, it's, 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 it's arbitrary. Go ahead. It means self, self-creating, that life is self-generating, self-creating, self-changing. And, and the, thing, the thing that I think you miss is that it keeps changing, that in each cycle of it, it changes into something else. You are not the same as your father or your grandfather. Your kids are not the same as you. It just keeps moving, and it started moving a very, very long time ago. Uh, but I I got to ask you some questions about your position because I'm not sure. I'm, so, I'm sort of uh, got a moving target here. Now, you believe in intelligent design, right? I mean, I think that's rather obvious. Okay, good. So, when was this intel? When did this intelligence happen back in history? Back four point two. You know, let's go back all the way across four point two billion years. When did was the intelligence injected into life? I'm not really sure how that's relevant to whether or not there was intelligence. What? Of course, we're, 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 I, I thought we were, I thought we were debating whether or not. There was an intelligence required or not well, required. Required. So, so I don't yeah. really it doesn't really matter when the specific time oh, was. It's whether hey, or not it, it's just whether or not it's required for life. Idea, and idea is not gonna be science until you guys settle on a time, until you settle on a place in that in, in the origin of life story, you've got to settle on a place. Was it eukaryotic cells? Did was that intelligently Put together or created like I would create a table in my garage. Yeah, I, I mean, directly answer your question. I mean, my, my personal opinion is that uh, we are not from. I mean, you're you're asking me if I'm agreeing with a single cell and upward uh, growth, and I do not. I think that things were created in their functional form. Okay, you think things were created six thousand years ago as kinds? 
With, because, again, the time factor has zero relevance to whether or not, A, I think they were, and yes, I do, and B, oh, no, that, do with that... No, no, it doesn't. <laughs> the the struct the full structure of a g of genetics and a genome for all known forms of life exists in a functional form that we observe and we observe yes we do we see replication absolutely do we see slight, do we do we see, do we see slight modifications absolutely what are they result of well what we're discovering now is that they're the result of uh, almost 99% of them are epigenetic variables and what? Uh, oh, no, no, no. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, no. Where do you get ninety nine percent epigenetic? No, genes, uh, genes, genes code for things. I mean, uh, the information has a hell of a lot to do with it. Epigenetics is. Uh, no, no, no I, I'm, I'm talking about modifications to the expression of the of the existing of the source data. You talking about tissue types? No, I'm talking about. Okay, are, are you familiar with epigenetics? Yes, I've got books on it. Thick okay. ones. Okay, so I don't, I don't care about. I'm talking. We're talking conceptually here. The what we are discovering are the outcomes of epigenetic uh, variation, right? Methylation, the different what what actually happens when that occurs, right? Those are modifications to the existing source code. Correct. I was reading about that stuff 16 years ago. It's uh, no, it's it's modifications to the temporal pattern at which it, in which things express. It controls tissue type primarily. And the you you think epigenetic only do you understand, do you understand how chromosomes are organized in the cell and how they uh, basically how they're how they're expressed? I I, I do, and, and I, I'm not suggesting that you know chromosome regions. Oh my God! Okay, we are discussing. This is like basic stuff. The I'm, we're talking about epigenetics, and you're telling me that you think the only, the the majority of epigenetics is just tissue modification. That's primarily what what happened. That's primarily what epi epigenetics controls when so you so you, expressed right. Uh, that's that's one aspect of what epigenetics does. What is the other aspect? Uh, it also determines whether or not certain things are even expressed at all. Yes. I mean, of they've course. been and they've been discovering that in the, in the context of yes something modified between this generation and that generation oh, but so what, we're, what, we're, what we're finding is many of the the majority of those modifications are the result of epigenetic that so were passed in the very in the areas that were not uh, didn't have the uh, imprinting and the uh, and within a couple of generations a lot of those modifications fall off yes they're not, they're not permanent Epigenetics is not permanent. No, it might, and and they were surprised, kind of, to find out that it went down one or two generations, and it does. But then, uh, since then, we've learned a hell of a lot about other things that are transferred from mommy to the ch to the children, like like the gamete, for instance. But uh, epigenetics, the, the, the that's the naive version of epigenetics. There are there are twelve, I think, twelve different mechanisms: ubiquitous ubiquitation methylation uh just a whole bunch of them I, I'm, a, I'm aware that there's many more but it's all about when a gene is expressed and, and some are promoted i mean there are promotional epigenetics. I, i'm not you, you do realize i'm not disagreeing with you there's multiple variables well, and, and very, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in agreement with you on that what i'm saying is 99 percent and i'm just like whoa what do you mean 90 well i guess I'm, I'm, I'm referring to the uh evolutionary model that the uh what are you talking about these, these, these modific we, you were talking about uh all this growth and change over time right and i'm not suggesting that the point i was making is that i'm not suggesting that uh there aren't things that uh modify and adapt the point i'm making is that they are generally variations on existing function and then we have to go back to where did the existing functions come from and what are the root requirements for those existing functions to exist and if they require logic rules and programming and syntax semantics and pragmatics that i think we're actually kind of agreeing on here uh, is what is in any other context what are the requirements for those things to exist and which is why i asked you the question in the beginning of separate from nature could any of those things exist without intelligent agents which you don't, which you kind of danced around. Well, of and, course they can. 
So how do you explain the uh, how do you explain the genetic code coming into existence then? Are we going to talk about abiogenesis or are we going to talk about eukaryotic cells? No, we're talking about abiogenesis. Okay, we're talking about the very beginning. You want me to peer back four four point two billion years ago and conjecture about what's going on? I've got a ton of books. You, you wanted me. You wanted me to conjecture on what what the time was four well, billion years okay. ago when the intelligent agent came into play. So what I'm saying is, if you are arguing that one is not required, then right. in any other context, what we observe would require an intelligent agent. Then what, what is your position of how it happened without one? When have we ever observed an intelligent agent creating a life? No, I'm, I'm talking about the fund. I mean, are you not actually listening? Because are you just trying to dodge? Because you know exactly what my position is. I made it I'm very, listening very, very to you exactly what you're saying. And I'm so, trying, I'm you know, trying to get I, you to I, see how ridiculous your position is. You're saying so, that so, an intelligent yeah. agents design life. And you can't tell me an instance of an intelligent agent designing a life. Uh, so obviously, life had to come from something that was not an intelligent agent. Well, that, that's, the a, universe is that's, intelligent. A, that's a presupposition that presupposition. I, my presupposition is that based on the evidence that uh, it is the more logical, plausible and probable conclusion that an intelligent agent was required. Based because, on the interpretation of the evidence. Because, because in, you no, in no other context would the things that are required for life in any other context be considered to be able to exist without an intelligent agent and if we have no and that's why i'm asking you the direct question of what is your i don't care what it says in the books or you can quote books i don't care i want to know what your position is of how the genetic code and the proteins required for its expression what is your position on how that came into existence mine is that an intelligent agent was required that's my position what is yours Mine is that it happened in a uh, kind of a the uh, hellfire of the early 100 billion year old Earth with boiling water and smoking hydrothermal vents and all sorts of minerals and clays interacting and bombardment from outer space and all of that coming together and basically there is a there is some mechanism by which it happened. Uh, but we will probably never figure out exactly which one it was because I think there's probably thousands of different ways that it could have happened. So my position is strict naturalism. I don't believe there's any intelligence. I believe life was self-creating. I don't think early life had the DNA, DNA code or made proteins or any of that. I think the very earliest uh, pieces of life were probably like a little bubbling clay cylinder with uh, with a hydrogen gradient. Uh, <laughs> okay, so then how did that turn into what we now observe as life? Well, that's it's kind of what we're working on. You know, what do you expect? It's only twenty twenty, dude. It's not. It's not twenty four. You know, twenty four. Whatever. So, so is it your opinion that through undirected process, non random uh, information? can come into existence. Yes, I believe that it's inevitable. I think uh, at, at the, in this temperature band that we're in on, on the earth, we're, we're, in, a, we're in that uh, the Goldilocks zone basically where water is liquid and things get occasionally hot and water is we're, we're right at those three states, you know, with water. Yeah, and, but per, the per when, that happens, when that happens, it is inevitable that... Yeah, but, but per I, the... The per the non-intelligent design uh position the earth the early earth that is being claimed to have been the environment for life to come into existence uh was nothing like it is now right it was very very strange and it was harsh it was, it was a harsh reality back then it, per, per the position that's taken and from a chemistry perspective that absolutely eviscerates the uh, positions that somehow this stuff could just form and stay uh, stay in that structure when we know that RNA, for example, inside of a cell, when it's protected, only has about a 15 to 20 minute shelf life. And, You're protein, talking about and RNA protein, 15 to 20 minute shelf life. Did you know that mRNA has a, has a uh, 10 hour half life? In you know? The, Do you know why it does? After, after it has been uh, created, after it's been modified, 
and 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 and, tr and structured and yeah absolutely and, and, if that stuff doesn't happen and it's also inside the cytoplasm at that point and, and you know, it has uh, the cell membranes which is the entire point i was making inside of an existing cell the potential life of it can expand dramatically but when you take that away it shrinks do you know what a poly do you know what a poly a tail is C continue Okay, you don't. Okay, uh, the, the basically the five prime methyl, five prime cap on mRNA and the poly A mm -hmm. tail is what keeps it uh, basically stable. And mm -hmm. they've also created in a lab small uh, poly, uh, basically polymer RNAs that are stable, uh, surprisingly stable, because it loops back on itself. And there's just all sorts of possibilities. Great, great. And we don't even know if it was RNA back then. We don't in, know if it was RNA. In, in, in what we observe, what causes that? Is it proteins? What? What causes what? What we're discussing right now. Is you it mean, pro are proteins what are required for what you just described to even happen? For what part of what I described? I'm not following you. Okay. I'm, okay. I'm, for, for, for mRNA to exist, yeah. what is required? What is required for mRNA to exist? You mean for it to be created? I mean, I think that's what exist means, yeah. Uh, basically, polymerase 2 and a bunch of... Okay, now we're talking about eukaryotic cells again. We've left abiogenesis. No, you're, right now, you're talking about mRNA and its stability. And I'm saying, how does mRNA even come into existence? And as you know, and you're starting to describe there, is that it requires proteins. How... how into existence in a eukaryotic cell, which is what happens now. We were talking 4.2 billion years ago. I'm what I, I, field I, you want to land on. So <laughs> with the goalposts. Well, no, no, I'm not changing the goalposts. They both the logic applies to both sides. If, no, okay, you are are you suggesting that mRNA can somehow be transcribed from DNA way back when, pre-life, unless a protein exists? Is that what what I think DNA existed 4.2 billion years ago. We're talking about abiogenesis. You, okay, you, well, you, I don't think I don't think that you keep clay, bringing concepts. Are, are, you, are you saying that clay little uh, that clay is life? Is that what you're saying? Clay and uh, possibly uh, many different nucleotides, many different amino acids, all sorts of uh, sugars and phospholipides, and God knows what what it. God knows what we had back then. There were a lot of there were a lot of varieties of organic chemicals. Right, but nobody suggested that organic chemicals by themselves are life. You're looking basically. You're looking at a you're looking at a point where there's no life and a point where there is life, and you're trying to find the line. You're not going to find that. Well, that's like saying that because you have the bricks, mortar, wood frame, wires, and piping sitting on a piece of dirt that it's somehow that constitutes a reasonable explanation explanation for a house building built now you're talking about apes and tool building tool tool building no apes. i'm making a direct uh, comparison you're stating oh, that because you're organic you're saying that because chemi organic chemicals are laying around that that somehow explains life coming into existence well, without an, without an intelligent agent and i am stating that that is like saying you have all the pieces and the components required for a house sitting on a, on a piece of dirt and without an intelligent agent, somehow the house was built. The fact that the the the, the boards are sitting there has zero relevance to God, whether or not it's reasonable for a house to come into existence. That's like Gene said in uh, in uh, in standing, high standing. Uh, that that's like they're constantly thinking that life is like a automobile factory with the Ford Motor Company. I mean, you're using analogies from a tool building ape, which is basically our prejudice. We see everything. We see everything as us coming up with an idea in our in our supposed minds and going out and uh, and suddenly creating it. Well, it doesn't just create with intelligence. You have to move your hands. You have to saw things. You have to look at things. You have to smell things. Uh, it, it's basically your prejudice is this tool-building ape. So you see the tool-building ape in all of life. Well, I don't. So, uh, so are you I, I so you're suggesting that... Genesis. So are you saying that things such as the Gila case are not uh, biomechanical machines. What's that? So are you suggesting that the Gila case, for example, is not a nanomachine? 
No, I, I would not call it a machine or a nano machine. No. Okay. Well, I mean, it's it's well recognized as that, and many proteins are directly referred to as nano machines, and we are directly trying to create nano machines. So you're saying that something that is a fundamental component for DNA uh, transcription is and that operates just like a machine on the molecular level is not actually a machine. We could call it a machine. We could also call it magic like you do. I'm, I mean, not, I'm not calling it magic. I'm calling it direct nanotechnology. Direct nanotechnology. I don't know. It's uh, We're looking for nanomachines that work a little better than that shit in the cell. I mean, it's a little, little better. <laughs> Our best nanotech is a joke compared to the proteins that are making life possible. Yeah, but at least it's going to be predictable when we get it, whereas the cell is totally unpredictable. Uh, I don't. Uh, yeah, we endeavor to create wonderful machines, and uh, I think we'll we'll kick the cells ass eventually if we keep working on it. The problem is we don't have little fingers like your God has. You know, we can't get in there and modify those molecules. So I'm getting very tired, John. Uh, okay, okay, so let's uh, real quick, just for just for the audience's sake. Uh, oh, you win for the audience's sake. Okay. Praise, I'm going to share my screen real quick. And then we just have, um, I've got a question for you, John. Actually, we, as usual, we got a lot of questions that came in due to time constraints. Uh, Mike, if you don't mind, maybe we'll just spend five minutes just going through them really quick. Uh, not all of them, but maybe about three or four of them and then call it a night. I know it's late for you, Mike. Oh, we wanted to wrap up. Okay. Well, the, well, no, no, no. I think, uh, if, if you wanted to uh, finish up your point there, John, of course, I just wanted to jump in and, and, you know, let everyone know about the question. So uh, whatever you were going to do, John, proceed. All right. Uh, am I still sharing? Okay. All right. So this is animation of the DNA transcription process. I'm yeah. not sure why. I'm not sure why audio is not working, but uh, those are recognized by pretty much every institution as by uh, of nano machines. Uh, the helicase spins at, I think it's 100,000 RPMs a second. Uh, they're literally pulling, separating, copying both forward and backward simultaneously. And to me, uh, yes, this is being done on a molecular level, but that is very obviously a technology that is being executed right there. And it is a well-recognized fundamental requirement of every, the, of life. And to say that that is not what that clearly is. Uh, John, it, are you trying, are you, so, hey, sorry to jump in. Are you trying to sh uh, screen share something? Is, is it not coming through? No, I don't see anything. Praise, okay. can you jump in here, please? Make sure that it's uh, being uh, screen shared. Well, just so mind. John can make his point. Never mind. We'll, uh, we'll do it another time. Anyway, they're wonderful videos. They're wonderful teaching tools. And, yes, yeah, so that stuff is going on, and it's going on at that rate. And okay. So, yeah, but you, you, just, but you just said that they're not machines. They're not nano machines. I wouldn't call them machines. It's, they're sort of misleading. Uh, it's okay. We're, we'll, we'll wrap up. the. Uh, okay. So... In your strict naturalist form, are you like, do you just avoid admitting that nanomachines exist in biology? Uh, nanomachines? Uh, nanomachines are something we're working on. We're creating molecular machines and they're going to be a little more predictable. But no, I, I think calling them machines and making all these analogies is misleading. Those animations, while they're wonderful, what, what they leave out is the fact uh, that there's there's all these ions and all these proteins clustered together, slamming into each other, and it's all stochastic. And you're not seeing a real picture. We cannot, we can't imagine. I mean, you can't look at atom balls. It's the atom ball idea of chemistry. People believe in it, and uh, I use it all the time when I study organic chemistry, but it's not really what's happening, okay? We're down in a quantum world down there.
It's very, very different. And I, uh, I just push back on calling them machines because you end up with silly ideas like ID where you can't even tell me where the ID is injected. So, so, so you're suggesting that when Harvard and MIT and Stanford and uh, all of those institutions directly recognize uh, proteins such as the helicase and others as nanomachines, are you, you stating that they are incorrect? Have you read these papers from the Royal Society? They disagree with a lot of that terminology, and I do too. And sure, a lot of scientists are going to say they're machines, and I've probably said they're machines too. And I make I, I could talk at length about how wonderful the nano machines are in biochemistry, but I'm saying it's misleading. It gives you gives you the wrong idea about how they came into being. Okay, so how did they come into being? Uh, we're back to we're back going back four point. No, I'm, I'm, talking, I'm talking about right now. How did they come into being right now? How do they come into being right now? Yeah. How do we, what do we observe that makes them come into being? Your mama. I'm talking on a cellular level as we speak right now, happening inside your body. How do these things that you call not machines, but how do they come into existence? How do they come into existence? Well, that's the whole of molecular biology, basically. The cell is a living organism. It's been around for four. No, no, I'm, I'm, talking, I'm talking about the proteins that you're you're talking about not being machines. How do they come into existence inside of our cells billions of times a day? other proteins, other RNAs, and DNA, and many other little mechanisms. So, so, the, so the DNA is, uh, a gene is, is transcribed into mRNA that goes to the ribosome, which then turns it into a, the information that is in the code into a protein, right? And where did you get those original ribosomes and those, that original DNA from? Uh, well, that's the question. I have, okay, I, have, your first I, have, I have stated that it's an intelligent agent required because it is organized non-random specific information with in a coding and a programming structure that has syntax semantics and pragmatics and the and arbitrarily assigned values which result in the specific sequence of information being translated into a functional protein and that it requires a information uh, transfer process the which I of arbitrary again of arbitrary values which i don't see how it is a remotely plausible conclusion that that could not happen with an intelligent without an intelligent agent when the things that we are trying to do that are similar absolutely 150 percent require a intelligent agent and are not anywhere close to as complex and exquisite and functional as what exists inside of every form of life yeah because we are life trying to recreate life, right? We're tool making apes. I mean, that's all we are. And we're not very good at it. We're, we're getting better, you know, but uh, I'm not sure how long I was muted, but basically you were, you were a single cell and that, that single cell inherited ribosomes and a number of others, uh, mitochondria, cell membranes and everything from your mother who inherited from her mommy and daddy and their, her mommy and on, on and on back. And the whole thing starts 4.2 billion years ago. And there's, there's a continuum, right? There's a continuum in this increasing complexity. And it's very, very difficult to look back 4.2 million billion years and tell you exactly what path was so, taken. So, with the, so, that, uh, so that single cell we started out as a zygote, um, right. did that zygote contain an entire, an entire genome? Yes. Okay, so it had all of the information requirements. Well, no. Uh, it needed your mother's womb. It needed the world. No, 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 no. no. I'm saying it did have all the information requirements in the new, because the zygote is now a new uh, life form. It's no longer the mother or the father. Okay, it's you should read it's now a new one. So, you did, so with all the information that was required for it to be able to grow inside the mother's because the mother is providing the nutrients right but the mother is not actually the one that is doing the execution and the gr of the growth that's now happening oh no inside, oh. inside of her uterus no that that womb has a whole lot to do with the development there is no separate you can read dennis noble's uh dance dance to the tune of life he pushes very much back against in, dna being the only information necessary and oh, I, I agree there's plenty of other things outside of I agree 100% there's more things than just DNA. If you had been born into a void, 
you never would have happened. You never would have had a mind. You never would have had consciousness. Nothing would have ever happened with your brain other than a disaster, and it would have killed itself. Okay. Then, then how did the first form of life uh, ever grow? This life stuff. But we, we should answer questions, John. We we should do this again. Yeah. Hey, if you guys want to just kind of wrap uh, wrap everything up, maybe tie up some loose ends if you wanted. If you want to take thirty seconds there, Mike, and then sure. you take thirty seconds as well, John. We'll quickly get through the uh, the questions and, and we'll call it a night. Okay. My my summary is that John is wrong, and he uh, he's very evasive about uh, where this ID came into effect, and I'm sort of disappointed in that. And that's it. He's wrong. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll let it go. Well, it's very ironic that I am uh, the one that's wrong and being uh, accused of evading when I f it's pretty obvious to the audience that uh, the one evading answers to questions was the strict naturalist. And the points that I've put forth are very simple, that we require structured information programming and coding in order, and as well as nanotechnologies, which are derived from that same information in order for life to exist. Are there additional variables? Absolutely. It, it influenced the end outcome, 100%. But they, none of that would occur without the original source data. So uh, until unless you are willing to conclude that all of that can happen purely through undirected, undirected processes in incredibly harsh environments in the supposed ancient times for the origin of life, uh, I don't really see how those are logical, plausible, or probable conclusions, but I hope you guys enjoyed it, and uh, thanks for joining us, Mike. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that was a really good discussion. Uh, Fast-paced. You guys kept it fun and entertaining, so thanks to the both of you. Uh, we'll go through a few of these questions real quick, and uh, call it a night. Mike, thanks for staying up late for us. I know you got to get up early, so uh, let's, uh, let's start with Bill Morgan. Bill Morgan asks, speed of sound, does it take intelligent design to turn raw iron into a samurai sword? Do you think a samurai sword can happen by chance? Do I think a samurai sword can happen by chance? Not bloody likely. Uh, no, not, not likely. I'm going to go with uh, it is possible for some weird shit to happen, some Douglas Adams level stuff. Basically, I mean, there's no reason why those molecules couldn't be where they are. But it's just not very likely. Okay. Bill Morgan is an engineer, and he's he's one of my favorite engineers to listen to. My favorite clueless engineers. So. And one day, maybe you and Bill can have at it as well. I think that'd be. I don't think that's gonna happen. But speed, no more yo mama jokes. Okay, it's not allowed on this channel. <laughs> no, your mama. Is, your mama is a perfectly valid answer to how you got here. <laughs> okay, let's go. George Bond, question for SOS. Do you consider the MO1 bacteria with seven tails and 24 interconnecting gears a product of chance? No, I don't consider life a product of chance at all. It's a product of inevitability of the way the universe, the universe is structured. And uh, what was that guy called? God, I'm not, not aware of that bacteria. What uh, I really want to look at him. Could you read that to me again? Yep, the uh, MO1 bacteria. I can email you the exact name if you want. Well, I mean, that is it. Um, okay, well, we got a couple for John, too. So let's go to one for, uh, for John. Call Me Emo asks, by what method or methods do we identify the descendants of an original design? For example, can all insects be descended from an original archetype? Explain your answer. Go ahead, John. Uh, well, all, all insects is a very uh, an extraordinarily broad uh, range. Uh, theoretically possible, um, I would wager that there were archetypes for a variety of different types of insects. But they answered my question, or that, that question. Okay, well, let's go to the next one then. We've got Nephilim Freeze coming at you there, Speed. Oh, he yeah. asks, what is the reason for believing that the use of symbolic meaning can arise from non-intelligent processes? DNA employs semiotics. Take your time. That's kind of the 
the basic point of semiotics is how that stuff comes into existence and uh, and how how it has a physical basis. Basically, that is semiotics. I don't I I don't see a problem. I mean, I uh, have you looked into neurons and you know how the brain is structured? It's uh, it's inevitable, uh, basically. It's it's inevitable. How, if it, if yeah. the information if the semiotic information doesn't exist in the genetic code, how does the Semi neuron ever? How does the neuron ever come into existence? The semiotic code exists in the DNA. If the symbolic representation of the information in the genetic code is not translated, how does that neuron come into existence? It certainly isn't like a blueprint DNA. Uh, Dennis Noble said it's more like a symphony. And uh, there, there, there's no direct relationship between a neuron and, and a part of your DNA, okay? A code in your DNA. You're just missing the point entirely if you believe that. So you don't think that the neurons are formed by di expression of different portions of the genome? Not only that, I mean, there's much more than that. There, there's additional variables. I, I I understand all this. I'm talking about the root of it. No, there's there's no plan for a neuron in the genome. No, not directly. Not in the way you're saying. Right. How, 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 and, and, right. But how how do how do the different cell types uh, come into play? Well, that's where your epigenetic, your uh, the non naive view of epigenetic. No, no, no I, I, that's this. No, this is the whole point of where I'm going. Is the variability of the source information enables the different cell types through epigenetics and other variables to uh, take on different forms, but from the same information. So again, going back to the semantics and pragmatics aspect of this, the point I'm making is without foreknowledge from an intelligent agent, how do the how does the ability for those variations to come? I think we have like over a thousand different known cell types. Like, are you just suggesting that all that just stuff just happened randomly, even though we're now being able to figure out like direct cause and effect that, that's happening as a result of these things that we're talking about? Okay, the reason you think I'm evasive is because I'm not letting you channel me into this way of talking about the genome as having some sort of a blueprint to create a neuron. It, it's a lot more. It's it, there's are there are many more things involved in that. If you look at uh, morphogenesis, basically, it's 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 like a it's like a symphony unfolding. Okay, it's uh, not. I'm, a, I'm aware. You, you think we think I'm ignorant on this? I'm, I'm aware of all this stuff that we're talking about. There are root components that are required, and without them, none of this that we're talking that symphony could never take place if the violins and the harps and all the and the flutes did not weren't already in place. You could never have a symphony. And if you, the symphony, the music for the symphony, those instruments are gonna play could not happen without intelligent agents uh, to operate them. And the music that they're going to execute couldn't exist without a original composer is the entire point. Original composer. <laughs> you see, I'm not gonna respond to that kind of crap. I mean, you're just- Sorry, are you, sorry, sorry, are you, sorry, are you suggesting, so are you suggesting that Beethoven's fifth could ever exist without Beethoven? We're not talking. Music, we're talking about cells. cells. Okay, let's get on to the next question. So we've got Snake was right uh, for the super chat. Thank you there, Snake. Um, he says, John, bricks do not do anything by themselves. Chemicals react with each other on their own. He's coming at you, John, so you uh, you can have a response there. Well, as we've discussed on more than a few occasions, Snake, the a chemical reaction is has nothing to do with the information that is being has been assigned to it. Just like if you have fireworks, it's just a chemical reaction. But if the fireworks are timed and set off with different colors and it shoots off a flag, that means there was somebody behind it. And that's exactly what's happening in the chemical reactions that are happening in biology that which make life possible. See if the cells are fireworks, okay. Well, yeah, they have a lot in common with that, except for the part about somebody being behind it. There was no uh, tool-making ape behind it, so. 
I'm sorry. Uh, you're just sticking an ID in there, and there's no logical connection between your if, between your uh, antecedent and your consequence. Uh, I am uh, I'm kind of dying here. Are there any other questions for me? I'm having a blood sugar attack. That's why I'm ill. Uh, no problem. You know, we, we we do have a lot more. We'll just end it with this one last question. Well, you uh, can ask. I, I'm willing to answer my questions if if you want to do me first. But okay, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll we'll end the stream with this one, and then if there's any, um, yeah, the audience was lively, so we got a lot of questions. So we'll just end it with this one. Speed, I know it's getting late for you. So, uh, question uh, from Bill Morgan again: Could anything in nature be so complex that you would conclude it was probably the result of design? Anything in nature would be so complex. I guess uh, those. Buildings in the uh, what the hell is that uh, crazy city with all the oil money? Dubai, Dubai, right? Those things, <laughs> yeah, they're pretty complex. But uh, no, I I don't think that there's any way to find uh, intelligent. There's no way to conclude for intelligent design based on the complexity of the item. I I don't think you can do that. There's there's only you know, like Paleo's watch, you know, there's, uh, we recognize that watch. We know about human tool making. So we recognize human tools. But I mean, if we find some very, very bizarre, complicated crystal forming in the ocean, and it's got all sorts of intricate branches, and it just, you know, and it, and it traces out numbers, even like the number three or whatever, I don't think we can conclude positively 100% that there was an intelligent designer there. Uh, I don't think you can do that with information. Information is too wily to train it into having to be intelligently designed. Okay. So you are you stating that prescriptive information and formal information is uh, the equivalent of a crystalline pattern? Uh, and a uh, a periodic crystal, like uh, uh, and of course I'm I'm starting to lose names now. Who was that famous quantum mechanics guy that wrote What is Life? Uh, anyway, aperiodic crystals. And now I, I completely lost my train of thought. Okay, well, <laughs> well, you know what? Thanks um, for answering yeah. that question there, Speed. It looks like the audience had fun. George just brought uh, sent in a super chat. George, thanks so much. You're uh, putting our kids through college. So he says, this has been entertaining. So lots of fun. Uh, flew by. Uh, tomorrow we got a, another exciting one, of course. We've got um, John Maddox and Gutsick Gibbon. So we're looking forward to that one. Um, any last words, uh, guys, before we shut it down for the night? If anybody has any questions that I didn't answer, if they want to do it in like the comment section of this thing, I will try to get to them. I, I, I don't, the one thing I don't ever want to be is evasive. And I know John, you think I was, but I was avoiding you putting your mindset into my mouth. Uh, but anyway, I would like to, I would like to answer any questions that, uh, that I did not get to in the chat. Okay. And it's just that uh, it is very late for me. I didn't want to do it this way. You guys ever consider doing a debate with me on a Saturday morning or afternoon? Uh, I will kick your ass. For <laughs> okay. Well, we may take you up on that offer. But uh, that being said, this was a really good discussion, really good debate, one to remember. Uh, any last words, John? Uh, no, thanks for uh, staying up late for us. Hope you're able to get up and uh, make it to your meeting tomorrow. And uh, Hope the audience enjoyed it. We had a good time. And uh, Erica, I'm looking forward to our debate tomorrow. Okay. I have your phone number, John. I'm going to call you uh, when I start that meeting at 4 a.m. <laughs> so, okay. Mike, no, okay. Hey, no prank calls, okay? <laughs> okay, guys. <laughs> I'm out of here. We're going to yeah. hand it over to our fabulous producer here. Uh, without praise, none of this could happen. So praise. Thanks so much, brother. Um, shut her down whenever you're ready.